This is Hannibal here from the HannibalTV.com, and I am with none other than Cauliflower Alley Club award winning wrestler, former Fabulous One, former Skinner, as well as numerous other gimmicks. He was even one of the doinks at one point. Steve Kern, how are you doing today, sir? Doing awesome. How are you, Han? I'm doing I'm doing very well. Happy to be talking to you. Uh, to get this started, could you maybe tell us a bit about your childhood? That's going back a ways. Um, yeah, I grew up in Tampa, Florida, and I was a wrestling fan. I grew up um, um, with Mike Graham, Dick Slater, Hulk Hogan, Austin Idol, and a couple other guys that didn't make it for very long, but we were all kind of wrestling fans because Mike and his dad, Eddie Graham, was a promoter. I was a little different than most of them, though, because my dad was an a Air Force pilot, and he had, went to, he had gone to Vietnam when I was 13 years old and got shot down and was a prisoner of war in Vietnam from the time I was 13 to 21 for eight years. So I ended up working for Eddie quite a bit as a kid, picking up wrestlers from the airports and things like that. And so I'd, I'd already been introduced to the business when I was about 17 years old and done some work around it. Um, but I hadn't really no plans to be a wrestler. I mean, you know, I respected it a lot, but uh, it did, that wasn't what I was going to grow up to be. Even though I was a fan, I always looked at it like I didn't think I was going to be tough enough to get in. It wasn't until I went away to college my first year of college when I went from 160 pounds to 245 and I came home and Eddie took a look at me and said, we need to break you in. And I'm thinking, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know if I want to do this. And anyway, I fell in love with the business. And after that, 44 years later, now I'm retired. Where are you? I'm I'm back. I'm right here. Um, as far you mentioned Hulk Hogan, you grew up with Hulk Hogan. What was he like in his younger days prior to becoming a megastar? It's just a normal kid in Tampa. I mean, you know, he was two years younger than me. Um, actually, he was two years younger, but he was only one grade level behind me. And when I first started wrestling, he was a really major fan. And he would sit in the same seat at the armory there in Tampa every Tuesday night. And then on the weekends, I would sail a little small boat of a catamaran at a beach where he always hung out. And he'd come up to me and say, man, Steve, you got to get me into wrestling. You got to get me into wrestling. And I kept telling him, I said, Terry, you know, you play, you're playing a bass guitar in a rock and roll band. You're going to probably do better in the rock and roll business than you are in the wrestling business. And they said, you ain't going to make any money doing this. You know how many times I've had to eat my words with him about that? But that's um, that's kind of, I mean, you know, there was nothing exceptional about Terry except for he was big. He was just a big kid, but um, major wrestling fan growing up. Now, Eddie Graham was known for breaking wrestlers in the hard way and often having the uh, potential wrestlers stretched by shooters when they would ask to be broken in. Because you were already involved with the company and the family, being friends with with Mike, were they a little easier on you? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were really. I mean, you know, Eddie had a, you know, a system. What it was designed to do was give wrestlers respect for the business and to protect the validity of the business and, and use the word kayfabe. But when I first started and I went down there, Hiro Matsuda was doing my physicality. He was doing the exercises and then the wrestling. And then guys like Bob Roop and other guys would come in and shoot with us. But there was no work. It was all shooting. And the only one at my house was my mom because my dad being a prisoner in Vietnam, I'd come home and I'd have Matt Burns on my forehead, maybe my cheeks, uh, elbows, knees, whatever it was. And my mom would say, she'd look at me and she goes, where'd you get those? And I said, I'm trying to learn to wrestle. And she goes, well, I thought that was all fake. And I looked at her and I'd say, I did too. But something I'm learning is not the same thing as what I see on TV. But I went through six months of all of that torture and everything. And I really wanted to quit because it you know, <laughs> wasn't enjoyable. 
the sportatorium where I learned uh, in the middle of the summer was just like a microwave oven. There was no no windows, um, no ventilation, no air conditioning. And when they turned the ring light on, it just heated it up worse. So you'd be working out in maybe 100 and 105 degree temperature and dying. And then you'd have somebody stretching you on your back, rubbing your face in the mat, whatever. But I, uh, I kept saying, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. But I was too embarrassed to quit. I'd gone long enough to the point where I go, well, I just need to stick it out and see where this goes. And then just out of nowhere, about six months into my ass getting kicked every day, Eddie came to me and says, well, I'm going to smarten you up now, kid. And then the whole thing changed, the whole dynamics. Were you surprised when they told you, like, obviously you knew that there was something strange going on in wrestling. As you said, you thought it was fake before you went into the training. But were you surprised the day that they finally came up and told you that it was a work? Not not surprised. It was just I was a little puzzled of why I had gone through the other stuff for so long. And... It took a little explaining to me and, um, you know, a few trips with guys when I first started wrestling. And, you know, they just said that was Eddie's M.O. He was uh, always about protecting the business. He was strict. No no heels, baby faces riding together. Separate dressing rooms all the time. Nobody was to be publicly seen together if they were working angles and stuff. And if you were, you got fired. I wasn't surprised, Hannibal. It was just that I was confused. You got to remember, when my dad was shot down, I was 13 years old. They came to me and told me he was dead. The uh, McDill Air Force Base, where he was stationed in Tampa, a colonel came out and said, you know, your dad died today. He was shot down with the first SAM missile ever used in the Vietnam War. And he, had, he flew an F-4, the fastest fighter. And he says it blew up and exploded. So you're the man of the family from now on. Well, then here I am, 13. About 16, 17, I'm picking up wrestlers, and at 19, I'm breaking into the wrestling business, and um, I had gone without seeing my dad for so many years that, you know, I was looking for uh, hero images, and Eddie kind of fit that bill, so I kind of just, I admired him so much, I just wanted to make him happy, and so I just kind of stuck it out, but I was surprised when I first started more than I was when they smartened me up. I was surprised at what I went through at the very beginning because I couldn't figure out this is nothing that I'm seeing on TV and I'm, I'm getting my ass handed to me every day. And this is before tap out, you know, you tap out now or you do that. But back then you just screamed, I give up, I give up. I mean, you know, it even got to the point where when Hogan started, he didn't give up one time and Matt Suda broke his leg. So it was a real deal, but <clears throat> It paid off in the long run. I had an unbelievable respect and protected the business after that for the rest of my career. Till later, when everybody else got smartened up by me. Did you ever have to use any of the shoot moves that uh, Hero taught you or any of the other guys taught you, either protecting yourself in a match where somebody took liberties with you or from a fan attack situation? I, I never had to take, I never had to um, use any moves against opponents that were in the business. I mean, you know, <clears throat> one of the things is, is if you broke in in Florida, you had a reputation. So if I, if I went to Atlanta, Atlanta was pretty much the same as Florida at the time, NWA, Charlotte Territory. When I worked there, I worked against the Anderson brothers, uh, myself and Tiger Conway Jr., and you just got respect from the talent when they found out you'd broke in under Eddie. They figured you knew stuff, but they weren't sure how much of a shooter you really were. Now, I did use it a couple of times with fans. Um, I mean, you know, when I worked for Jerry Jarrett in Tennessee, whenever a fan would come and try to get in the ring or whatever, they'd always want me to go out there and wrestle the guy. And to be honest with you, you know, it's like, to me, it's all about winning. It's not whether it's fair or not. So the things I did was I kind of suckered them and stuff like that, but I ended up on top, and that was the whole idea with Eddie. You know, just don't let nobody beat you publicly. Just don't let nobody beat you publicly. And so, I, you know, I had a few tricks, but I was far from a shooter, that's for sure. So 
when they'd call me in Tennessee and say, hey, come on, can you go down there and wrestle this guy and stretch him? And I go, well, I can go down there and try. Most of the time, it was fairly easy. Every once in a while, I'd find somebody that was a little stout, you know, a big country boy, something like that. Like down, and I never really wanted to treat anybody the way I was treated, so I just tried to discourage them with front face locks. I mean, you know, cross facing. You know, um, one of my favorite moves was a sugar hold, so I would use that all the time, and I would tell them how I can hold you with one arm. I'm gonna hold. I'm gonna hold you with one arm, and I'm gonna make either your eyes bleed or your nose bleed. And you know, once you got them hooked, it was a piece of cake. But you know, it was easy to sucker them into those kind of moves. And, and front face locks were always effective for guys trying to leg dive and stuff. So, you know, it was just, it was, it was just I probably in my full 30 years of working, I used it maybe four times, just different things. And then I used, um, of course, the sleeper hold was my finish there. And I used that as a shoot. And actually on YouTube, you can go to YouTube and see me putting a get putting an announcer to sleep of a talk show that got kind of smart with me and said something about wrestling being fake. And I just kind of suckered him into letting me put the sleeper on him or put him out on his own show. But I mean, it was all about protecting the business in, in my era. And you brought up your dad a few times. I just had a couple questions about him when they found out he was a prisoner of war. Did the government give your family any money because he was obviously a prisoner of war from because he was defending the country, serving the country. And also did he ever make it back to the U S yes. Okay. On, on both of the questions. Yes. First of all, he never lost his pay. I mean, he continue to pay him. He was still in the military. He was still serving this country. And so they continued paying him. The only thing was I was confused because of this Colonel that told me my dad, first thing he told me was he was dead. And it was three months before they actually got a picture of him out of Hanoi, and we identified him. So for the first three months, I just thought he had passed away. Then later on, I realized he is, you know, captured, and he was a POW, and we'd see him maybe one or two times a year on special videos that they'd send where POWs decorating a Christmas tree or some other kind of garbage propaganda film they'd put together. So... He did come home. He came home in 1972, and he was there for one of my first matches in the armory in Tampa. And so he didn't. He he lived on to 2000, um, the right of 2000 in May, and died four days before Memorial Day, and was buried at Cape Canaveral with a full military um, honor funeral and a F-18 flyover missing man formation. He was a full colonel. He had come home and went back to educating, and he was a graduate from the Air War College in Montgomery, Alabama, so he retired as a full colonel. Wow. It sounds like he was a true hero. Absolutely. You know, he's one of only two men in history that was a prisoner in two wars. He was a prisoner at age 19, shot out of a B-17 over Germany, and he was a prisoner there for nine months. And then later on, 20 years later, he's a POW in Vietnam for eight years. Now, you were known as a tag team specialist. You held the Florida tag team titles, I think, something like 12 different times, the NWA Florida titles. Who were some of your favorite partners over the years uh, that weren't the fabulous ones? <clears throat> okay. Well, Mike Graham. Number one, he was one of my favorites because I'd grown up with Mike. I'd gotten the opportunity to be in the business. And if it wasn't for Mike, I would have never been in the business. Him and I going to school together and being friends and close. And then Jimmy Garvin was a good tag team partner. I had Tiger Conway Jr. as a partner in the Carolinas and worked against the Andersons for a year, Ole and Gene. And then um, Ricky Gibson was one of my most influential partners early in my career, and that was when I worked for the fields in Panama City, uh, Pensacola, and Mobile area. And so Ricky and I, um, Ricky was, you know, really a seasoned veteran when I, when I met him, and he taught me a lot. I mean, my partners usually always taught me something. 
um, just by watching them, especially if they'd been working longer than me. Bobby Backlund was a good partner. Now, Bobby Backlund was way inexperienced, so I was the veteran at the time. But he was so dedicated to his training and the things he did. I mean, he inspired me to alter my body and get rid of the baby fat and try to lean out and look more of the part. And I'd gone from a bulky powerlifting look and trimmed down. So in the partners, quite a few guys contributed to my career by being my partner. I'm going to get rid of this damn mask and kill him. Quite a few guys contributed to my career by just me witnessing them work, standing right out there beside them. When Bob Backlin was your partner, I guess by that point, they already kind of decided that he would eventually be the world champion. And he was in Florida, I guess, to get seasoning to prepare himself for that. Um, well, you know, there's a couple of different stories, Hannibal, and Kevin Sullivan was a close friend, and he tells another story about that whole situation, and I don't know which story's right and which story's wrong, but I'll tell my side is, um, Vince Sr. had asked me to take, um, a belt and drop it in New Japan Pro Wrestling to Fujinami, and they made a brand new belt, sent it to me. And then I was supposed to come home from going to Japan. And instead of working back in Florida, I was supposed to start in New York. And Andre the Giant was going to be my partner all around to try to get me over. And then I was supposed, I didn't have any idea that they had talked about a world title, but that was the plan for me to go into New York. When I came home, there was nobody to take my place as a single in Florida. And Eddie and Dusty pulled me in and said, listen, you know, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We don't want you to go to New York. We want you to stay here. And to be honest with you, I didn't want to go to New York. I was a little leery of the big cities, getting lost, um, too much traffic, whatever it was. I was so used to the laid back Florida living that I was satisfied just to stay home. Later on, Kevin Sullivan tells me, well, they had a bet. They had a bet that they could get Backlund over, even though they knew I was a sure thing. And the reason I was a sure thing for them for the angle they wanted was because of my dad being a war hero to work against Iron Sheik um, and, and, and just play off of the good old American boy, USA, son of a war hero. So there's mixed stories. I don't know which one's really the truth, but I never really worried about it or held it against anybody because it. I actually chose what I wanted to do, and that was stay in Florida and not go to New York. I have actually heard Kevin Sullivan uh, discuss that as well, and he was ob obviously involved with The Office, so he would have been privy to all that kind of information. You also feuded with Kevin Sullivan a bit. I think you actually won the national television title of the NWA from him once. Could you talk about working with Kevin? Yeah, um, you know, Kevin and I had been, we'd been in the Carolina Territory together, and we rode on all of our trips together there. We'd been in the Florida Territory together, and we became really close friends there. And then when we were in Atlanta, this was my second time to go through Atlanta, and I had come up the ladder a little bit. My first time was in 74, and I was more or less a job guy. I mean, you know, I was doing jobs on TV. I mean, I'd go over on house shows, but most of the time on TV, I was doing jobs. But Kevin and I rode together, and he, he gave me an idea about, let's work an angle. Let's see if we can get them to go for an angle where we have a baby face match on TV, and I'll double cross you. And we'll set it up old Florida wrestling style. And so we did. And it was on um, TBS at the time. And it was probably one of the only uh, stations that was running, you know, um, cable like national television. And we did the angle in the Omni to follow out of it. And it got over like mad. I mean, you know, because it was just, it was kind of a simple thing, but it was a baby face angle. We're both baby faces and Kevin turned. And then Jerry Jarrett came to Atlanta and talked to Jim Barnett. He had gotten uh tommy rich to leave atlanta and come up there but tommy rich wasn't getting over like he did in atlanta and tennessee and Jarrett wanted to trade back and so uh, jim barnett told jerry Jarrett, come to the omni you can pick out any two guys and i'll take tommy rich back 
Jerry Jarrett comes to the Omni. Watch me and Kevin Sullivan fight all through the Omni and up into the arena and up, up all the way up to the top level and then back down the stairs. He goes, I want those two guys. Next thing I know, we're in uh, Tennessee doing our angle and continuing it on from Atlanta TV. Was it Jerry Jarrett that came up with the Fabulous Ones gimmick for you ultimately? Yes, it was. Jerry Jarrett's idea. Jerry Jarrett, um, he got the idea from recreating the Fabulous Fargos. Jackie Fargo, Roughhouse Fargo, and Don Fargo dominated that area for years and years, 60s and 70s. And they were over like Rover. And, you know, he just, he knew... When he, when he worked with me for a year before we ever went into that angle. But he knew that if anybody's going to carry that ball, that I was going to be one of those guys that, you know, like that kind of a position, the pressure. And so um, it had nothing to do with Jackie Fargo coming up with the idea. It was all Jerry Jarrett. And then he, um, he put Stan Lane and I together, and he gave us what he wanted. I mean, he just sat down and told us. I was already 15 years into the business. so. I don't know if that's a veteran, but it was a long time and a lot of a lot of miles and a lot of territories and a lot of great guys that worked with me and helped me develop. And so he gave me the ball and I got to run with it. And so Stan and I just took it and ran. What were some of the highlights for you personally being a part of one of the teams that people would say one of the greatest teams of the 80s? Well, I'm sorry, Hannibal. What was the question? What were some of your your highlights? You fought highlights. so many top teams over the years. Well, you know, it was the way we got over was off of somebody else's reputation. Jackie Fargo was over in Tennessee, even though he'd stopped wrestling. When he endorsed somebody like Stan and I, that was something different to the to the fans in that Tennessee area, and so. I was amazed at how strong we got over. And, you know, because it, I'd been over in Florida, I understood, you know, like being over and being able to draw money and things like that. But at the same time, I mean, it was like a gold mine. No matter where we went, I mean, you know, it was just the crowds. I, I think that it was kind of confusing because it seemed we we're two good looking guys. Not, I, I know it's hard to believe now looking at me. But we are two good-looking guys, and that's kind of intimidating sometimes to men that bring their wives or girlfriends to the matches. They don't want the good-looking guy to be a good wrestler or be the hero or whatever. So, But having Jackie Fargo as our manager, it kind of pulled that veil down for us a little bit. So, you know, we didn't try to act like we're out there to be Chippendale dancers or pick up girls. We just acted like, hey, man, we're ready to fight. Paul Heyman said one time that after watching Stan and I wrestling the Sheep Herders and the Moon Dogs, he would, that's where a lot of the ideas came for ECW and hardcore because he saw some of the most hardcore matches in Memphis and Louisville and those places um, because of Jarrett just booked us and he would book us against these guys that would come in that were rugged, tough, didn't mind working with me. I was always stiff. I didn't mind if you were stiff with me, but I, I took pride in what I did. I didn't want to work so loose that you could see through it. And that it took a little while for me to adapt to Tennessee where there was more entertainment involved. But, you know, I tried to made a transition and just kept a little bit of my stiffness. But at the same time, it worked with the road warriors and everybody else. So, you know, you kind of develop something not meaning to, but you always have to change. No matter if I was in Atlanta, uh, Carolinas, or Florida, it was pretty much all the same wrestling. But the minute I moved over to Tennessee, now the entertainment and a lot of midget high spots and a lot of things that I wasn't really high on when I first went there, and it took me a while to adapt. But at the same time, you have to do what the, what the people want. You have to be able to go out and read your audience and work for your audience, not for yourself emotion it's the difference between the business now where they go by movement everything's about movement and memorization of moves to back then it was about emotion find out what's an emotional trigger on the audience bring them in let them be a part of it let them feel for you 
But you know, you developed it. We went to the ring and had the finish. Always separate dressing rooms. Nothing else. And in a 30-minute match, fill in the blank. Seven nights a week, nine times a week. You either got it or you got out. So most of the guys that I worked with in that era were really great workers because if they just did it full time so much. How was working against the Road Warriors? Uh, I believe you told the story on one of the Road Warriors DVDs about <laughs> uh, it getting pretty serious one night in the AWA. <laughs> well, I keep rubbing my nose. This mask has got this little fuzz on it and it gets it all over. So I'm sorry for this is distracting me, but okay, working against the Road Warriors was like the impossible dream at first, but I was too smart for them. I mean, you know, it's simple. They wanted to be over, and they had different ideas about what being over was. I remember Hawk said to me one time, what's your win-loss record? And I just looked at him and said, my win-loss record? And he goes, yeah, what's your win-loss record? And I go, man, I don't know. I've been in this 15 years, probably more losses than wins. And he goes, well, we've never lost. And I go, okay. Well, you don't have to lose when you work with me. I don't really care. To me, this is a business. But anyway, I didn't like being bullied. And Hawk tried to bully us a little bit at the beginning. And I mean, you know, I just outsmarted him is what I did. I mean, I just let him go, let him go, let him go, let him believe it was going to be the way he wanted. And then I double crossed him on the very end because, you know, at the very end, you're going back to the separate dressing rooms and you don't really have to deal with it. So I did it twice. I did it in Minneapolis in front of their friends, but then I did it again in San, I mean, in Puerto Rico. So they, Joe was easier to get along with and Joe kind of understood me that I'm a businessman. If they tell me to go out there and go over, when I get to the ring, my opponent doesn't need to come to me and say, we're not doing what the boss says. You're not going over. We're going to take it on you. Wait a minute. Now we're going against the whole system and the boss. And so I go, okay. And at the very end, I'm going to turn it around on you. But it might take me a little bit to figure it out. And in Minneapolis, I just kind of ad-libbed. But at the same time, I was taught by one of the best there ever was so far as the minds for the business, and that was Eddie Graham. And he taught me more than wrestling. He taught me how to book. He taught me how to um, talk to promoters. He taught me how to deal with Japan. He taught me how to do a lot of different things that a lot of guys never got. And that was because of his respect for my dad. And as far as the ladies, you guys were known as ladies, men, and – and all the territories had groupies back then, but where would have been the best territory for the ladies for you guys? Um, probably the Florida or uh, Tennessee. It sure wasn't the AWA. They were all cheese eaters. Man, the, the girls that came to the matches there outweighed me and stand together. I mean, you know, it was just bigger women and I mean, they used to be bundled up all year long, and they weren't beachgoers, that's for sure. So if in choices, of, you know, Tennessee or Florida would be better. I see. And why do you think that doesn't really exist in today's wrestling with uh, the way it used to be? It used to be more like wrestlers were like rock stars, and they would have those groupies. But now it seems to be mostly men that watch it. I'll tell you why. It's because it's not seven nights a week, 52 times a year in the same city. In Florida, I wrestled in West Palm every Monday night. I wrestled in Tampa every Tuesday, Miami every Wednesday, Jacksonville every Thursday. Friday was Tallahassee or Fort Lauderdale. Saturday was St. Pete. Sunday was Orlando. Monday, back to West Palm. You came every week. In the WWE or WWF, either one, they go into that one city once a year. They come back around next year. When they when they leave that city, they go from, let's say, Atlanta to Tokyo. It's not the same. I mean, it just it was more of a following because the simple fact you were there and accessible, fifty two times a year. I see. And you challenged Jack Briscoe at one point for the NWA heavyweight title. He's one of the all time greats, WWE Hall of Famer. Any memories of working him? Oh, yeah. He was my mentor. Jack was one of my, my mentors and my hero. 
I patterned myself after Jack Briscoe. If I was to say I stole most of my stuff from anybody, it would have been Jack Briscoe when I was in Florida. And then as I moved on, it came other, became other people. But Jack Briscoe was just, uh, he was he was the deal when I was growing up. I mean, you know, perfect baby face, two-time All-American amateur wrestler. I mean, you know, he had all the credentials. He had a lean body. He looked great. He could go an hour. He'd stand and smoke a cigarette and then go to the ring and do an hour. I mean, you know, I didn't smoke cigarettes, but at the same time, I'd go, you know, Jack, how are you in such unreal shape? I go, I'm doing all this cardio stuff. And he goes, ah, don't do that. He said, just do a couple of jumping jacks, go to the ring, and let everything else work out for you. But Jack taught me a lot. One of the things that Jack taught me, and later on when I became more of an educator, I tried to tell young guys, go out and watch the matches before you. Make sure you're not going to do something they've already done. Make sure that you know what the people are into right now. What are they buying? Do they want to see the heat first? Do they want to see a shine first? What is it that makes other guys make it to the main event? Study the guys that are in the last two matches. When you go out, watch their matches. See what they're doing to get over. See why the people react to them. And steal it. Steal whatever you need to. I mean, you know, we're all reincarnations of other wrestlers before us. And so I would go and study the matches. I studied the guys that were over. I studied the guys that, you know, got the most responses. Mr. Wrestling number two when I was in Atlanta. Phenomenal. I mean, you know, Bob Armstrong, phenomenal. The Anderson brothers, all, all the guys that I stereotyped under and patterned myself under were all those NWA guys that were more wrestlers than they were brawlers. When I first met Bruno San Martino, I was all excited. Then when I watched him work, I was really let down. I mean, you know, it was more brawling and less grappling. And I mean, you know, it was more about nationalities the first few times I went to New York than it was about your wrestling skills or your ability in the ring. I mean, if you were an Italian, you had an Italian following. If you were black, you had a black following. It was just, that was the way it was designed. When Bruno came to Florida, I watched him work and he worked like he was already over which was what my analogy was. My analogy was based on, okay, in New York and Madison Square Gardens, you can go out there and do a few things and get an unreal response because they've, they've been witnessing you for a long time. In Florida, we haven't seen you. And you're compare, we're comparing you to Jack Briscoe, Harley Race, Terry Funk, Dory Funk Jr. We're comparing you to more wrestlers. Love you, man. Here. Go on, Stan. <laughs> hey, Stan Lane. <laughs> It's my best part. Drive safe, Stan. Okay, sorry. Nice. We got a cameo from Steve. Go uh, from a tag team with him to Skinner in WWE. What was the transition like from that? You know, it's like we in Florida, we have this little lizard. It's called a chameleon. And the lizard... When it lays on brown leaves and brown dirt, whatever, it turns brown. When it lays on green leaves, it turns green. I'm smart enough to know that even though, like, I grew up with somebody like Hulk Hogan and, you know, got in wrestling business before him and know, known him all my life and were close friends, I couldn't stay in the same character like he did. I need to, if, if something wasn't working, I needed to change. And so when... I got the opportunity to go to work for Vince in the WWF. Hogan's the one that got me in there. And I had just killed 15 alligators in the first alligator harvest in the state of Florida. So I thought, well, maybe this will be cool. I took a bunch of alligator parts, a skull, a hide, the paws, some teeth, some things like that. And I laid them on his desk. And I said, I really don't understand what you're doing here yet. But there's nobody in that dressing room that dresses in a pair of wrestling tights like I'm used to. So maybe you could figure something out from this. And he said, let's do this. You go home, let your hair go back to normal color. It was bleach blonde from being a fabulous one. Uh, my beard was a short beard, kept real trim. He said, let it grow out, let it get real burly, and come back, and I'll have something for you. Well, I came back a month later. He signed me kept me on salary. I came back a month later and he said, did you see the movie Skinner? Um, did you see, no, I'm sorry. Did you see the movie Deliverance? And I go, 
yeah, a bunch of times. And he said, well, I want you to be one of those guys. And I'm thinking, because I was, I thought I was cute. So I'm thinking Burt Reynolds. So I said, you want me to be like Burt Reynolds? And he looked at me and he shook his head. Nah, that's not the guy I want you to be like. I want you to be one of the two guys in the woods with Ned Beatty that said, hey, boy, you got to write pretty mouth. I said, no problem. And I got to tell you, Hannibal, I had a blast with the character because for the first time in my entire career, I was doing an impersonation of somebody else. I wasn't having to be Steve Kern. It's the first time I never used my real name in the wrestling as a character. I was now I'm Skinner. And so my first match that I worked, Vince pulls me aside and said, hey, you out wrestle. You can out wrestle everybody on the card. You can't do all that wrestling. You're supposed to be an alligator poacher from the Everglades. You can't do sit out switches and chain wrestling and movement like that. You got to retard your learning back to just basic movement. And so I did. I mean, you know, um, what was that guy, Meltzer? Meltzer wrote on the dirt sheets that I must have been dropped on my head because Skinner couldn't wrestle at all. Well, Steve Kern works for somebody. He does what he's told. That's how you get paid. And that's how the check keeps coming. So as long as he was saying things, I just followed his lead. I just did what he wanted me to do. Anyway, and then Skinner started going downhill. And he was he had plans for me at first. And then all of a sudden, WCW started handing out contracts for guaranteed money in Atlanta. And everybody was jumping ship. My closest friends were like Randy Savage, uh, Ted DiBiase, I mean, you know, Mike Rotundo, um, Hulk Hogan, I mean, you know, the Nasty Boys. Everybody was jumping ship and going down to the money, guaranteed money. And so when Hogan left, all of a sudden Skinner's starting to get jobbed out. And I saw that I needed to do something and I wasn't sure I wanted to go to WCW yet. So I came up with an idea because Matt Bourne and I were the same size and Matt did a lot of wrestling when he started the Doink character. And I told Vince, I said, I got an idea. If I hit under the ring at WrestleMania and don't come out until Matt's match with uh, Crush, I could be the second Doink and it'd be kind of cool because they would know which one's which. And so Vince thought, he told me, he says, he says, are you on drugs? And I said, not all the time. And he goes, well, that's a goofy idea. Of course, the night of WrestleMania at Caesars Palace, he calls me up and says, come up here. I want to talk to you. And I went up to the top floor there and talking to him. He said, we're going to do your idea. You're going to hide under the ring. We're going to shave your beard off. And now you're going to be doink. Well, that was nice because it was my idea. But it was like the kiss of death. The last character I ever wanted to be was that freaking clown. And now all of a sudden I'm the clown. And then when the first opportunity I came came on me to jump ship, I deserted the clown and went down to WCW. One of your most memorable matches from WWE as Skinner was against Bret Hart on Tuesday night in Texas. Could you uh, tell us? Could you, could you tell us? Can talk I, about that? I'm sorry. I got that right up to there, and I interrupted you. My mistake. But oh no, I was just wondering if you if you could yeah. tell us your memories of that because that match is so well remembered. It was one of your best matches in WWE. Well, first of all, if you can't have a match with Bret Hart, then you just can't have a match at all. I mean, you know, Bret and I were friends for a long time. We had a lot of respect for each other. I mean, you know, even though I was doing a Everglades alligator poacher character. He knew I could work if somebody would work with me. The problem we had, you know, so far as who I would work with a lot of times was, you know, just it wasn't something that didn't fit. It was like taking a square and trying to put it in a round hole. Well, with Brett, it was easy. It was easy. And both of us knew exactly what to do when we went out there. I had total confidence in him. You know, I was willing to let him do anything to me or with me. And he was the same with me. So we were relaxed. That was one of the first times I relaxed as Skinner because I wasn't under the pressure of being this alligator poacher. I'm back to being a wrestler when I'm working with Brett. And Pat Patterson came to me afterwards and said, why haven't you been working like that before? 
And I thought he was setting me up. So I said, I didn't want to say because Vince told me not to. I just said, well, you know, I was just trying to figure out this character. So, you know. And you mentioned you jumped over to WCW. You were in a tag team there called Bad Attitude with Bobby Eaton. It was kind of a similar tag team uh, to what you've been doing before, but they never really got behind you. Were you under a guaranteed contract there at least? Did you get paid for your time there? Well, I did. That was why I was there. I was there guaranteed money, whether I wrestled or not, whether I was hurt or not, whether I was doing anything or not, I was getting my check every two weeks. And that's kind of where it fell in. They put me with Bobby because we had both had Stan Lane as a partner. Bobby had wrestled against me for years in Tennessee. I, I think he's one of the greatest wrestlers ever. He's just underrated. And, I mean, you know, it was a sure fit. You can't control what the office does with you, unfortunately, or I'd have never lost. And I'd have every world title around my waist right now. But you have to do what you're told to do. And if you want to make a living and you want to, you know, continue to make a living and go on to someplace else and not have a reputation of going against the grain, you just did what you were told. Now, I saw them, you know, it was a struggle there. And part of the struggle was I was one of those guys that was on a fence. Of, I had wrestled with the NWA so long that all the Charlotte guys that were being invaded by WWF guys were all against the WWF guys. And when I would walk in the dressing room, if I went to sit down with, let's say, Bobby Eaton and Paul Orndorff, then the Nasty Boys had come to me, sit with those guys. And if I went and sat down with the Nasty Boys, then the opposite, it's Orndorff coming to me. What are you doing with those guys? You're one of us. And I got kind of pulled apart like I was in a Confederate war or something, you know. And, I mean, the, to me, it was simple. It was the same business I've been in all my life, but the dressing room was no longer fun. It was like polit politics. And I didn't get along real good with Ric Flair because I had a tendency to say what I felt a lot of times. And he had a little bit of a control over Eric Bischoff. And I felt a little bit of a slip, but, you know, that's part of the business. You know, if you're going to be in this business, I always compared it to ocean life that I'm familiar with. And I started out as a minnow, and I had to become a shark real quick. And I had to continue to be a shark the rest of my career. The minute I tried to be a minnow again and just fit, fit into everything, somebody was going to gobble me up and run me out. And so, I mean, you know, I just had to do what I had to do. And and you know, Hannibal, as simple as this is what I did. I worked the workers. I worked the workers. I, I made them all think that I was on all of them's side, which I really was, but it was no favoritism. And that kind of got me in a shuffle down there to whereas they put me with Bobby, but they had beat Bobby like a drum by the time I got there. He was nothing more than an enhancement guy. And he had gone outlived the Midnight Express and everything. And now they bring me in. And I'd come from Skinner and Doink, and now I'm doing this. And so it was like two older guys that could make anybody look good, but they just didn't have any plans for us. And so handwriting is on the wall. So when, when I'm treated like that, that's the way I work. If you want 100% out of me, treat me 100% and pay me 100%. If you want 50% out of me, pay me 50% and don't take care of me. How long was your contract there? A year. A year, okay. You yeah. mentioned before you were friends with Randy Savage. Could you share with us any stories about Randy that uh, might not be out there? Oh, yeah. Well... Because he's passed, I, I walk a fine line, to be honest with you. I'm a loose cannon. I mean, you know, from where I've been and what I've done in this business, I mean, you know, I started off as an announcer to get used to the people, then a referee, then a wrestler. Then I promoted later on when I ran PWF for Florida, nine, early 90s, to um, teaching. My first student was Tracy Smothers. And then thousands after that but you know you it's just fitting in but randy randy was more or less just a wrestler he tried to promote a little bit and everything but randy had he had a funny side to him 
he was he was kind of like a complex guy. He was high maintenance, but he was a fun guy because that I always was messing with. I mean, you know, I would do things like Rand, to Randy, like him and uh, myself and Mike Rotundo would always split a room. Three guys in a room that we could all afford for a room, but we wouldn't get it separate rooms because we liked to hang out with each other. Then we'd flip for the bed every night. I always let Randy win because the flip for the bed was you slept, slept on the box springs and I take the mattress off and sleep on the floor. And I always made him feel like he beat me, but he was sleeping on that hard ass box springs. Um, one night when Randy was going through his divorce with Liz, he was on the phone like two o'clock in the morning. Me and Rotundo are trying to sleep and he's going, Hey, pick up the phone, Liz. It's me, Randy. And I go, you don't think she knows your voice by now? She ain't home. She's somewhere with her boyfriend, and he gets so upset. And then somebody, you know how when you spend the night in hotels, night after night after night, when you get up to go to the bathroom, you get sometimes disoriented. Well, I think it was Rotundo. He always said it was me, but I think it was him. But somebody went in the bathroom and went to pee and didn't turn the light on and actually pissed all over the floor. Randy slept in his socks. So Randy goes in there later on, and I hear Randy wakes me and Rotundo both of them. Hey, hey, what's this water on the floor? <laughs> and he turned on the light, and he said, man, it's about feet all over the floor. My, soak, my socks are soaking wet. And, you know, it just, his humor was in dry wet. And he was trying to be so serious sometimes, but he'd been around me too long. I mean, you know, that worked for new people that he's around, but it didn't work for me. So I played with him repeatedly, constantly. And I'd go rent a rent a car. I'd rent the smallest, crappiest rent a car you could rent. And he'd go, man, I can't pull up to the building in this. And I said, well, why don't you just let me drop you off on the corner and you could walk up. And, you know, he wouldn't even get, he wouldn't stay in a car with me when I'd rent a car, but it was nonstop. You have to entertain yourself when you're on the road as much as we were. We were gone sometimes 60 days in a row in those days. Did you ever have any run-ins with the Ultimate Warrior over the years? I don't know if your timings crossed in WWE or not. Uh, I just worked with him one or two times. Of course, I, I did a job for him. I mean, you know, what is, you know, I don't know if anybody that doesn't do jobs, but I mean, you know, they asked me to put him over and the warrior came to me on the second time we worked, and he go, He said to me, he says, hey, and he and he kind of put his hand up. He didn't put his finger on me because it, I don't think he was sure about what my capabilities were, but I was pretty, I was pretty brutal in the dressing room sometimes. Um, he said, whatever you do, don't spit that tobacco in my face. It messes up my face paint. And I said, oh, yeah, okay. And he goes, I'm just going to close line you a bunch of times and press slam me or something and beat you. And I'm going, okay, okay. So I knew exactly what I was going to do the very first move when he turned around running back and forth a hundred times and then comes over to face me. I spit the tobacco, which was nothing more than licorice. I couldn't chew real tobacco, but I spit it all over him. And it was like a challenge to him. I mean, you know, I don't mind putting you over, but don't tell me what I can do and what I can't do unless it's an injury you have and you don't want me to hurt you because that I might make a mistake. And he was he was kind of a rude and he was a real prick. And and that's as basic as I could put it. And so I decided, well, you know, let's just see how tough you are. Because if I spit this in your face, are we going to start shooting and let's see what you got? And, you know, of course it was a word. Of course he never came to the other dressing room when I went back in there and nothing was ever said, but that was about the extent of it. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't dramatic and it wasn't nothing after that, but it was, it was my statement to him that, you know, you need to respect me because I'm putting you over. And, of course, you were running Florida Championship Wrestling when it was a development territory for WWE. That was the last big thing you were doing in the business. How did you get that position? I know you had a wrestling school before, and that seems like it would have been a huge job. Okay, it was. And this is how I got it. I was a road agent, and I was a road agent for about five years. And I'd been bumped up and bumped up and bumped up to where I was doing the reports. 
pretty soon I was even doing settlements on the uh, buildings in the cities. And I was getting tired of it, to be honest with you, Hannibal. You know, the, the, the business and the road took a lot out of you. And I totaled 44 years between wrestling and the um, management side so far as being a road agent and owning FCW. So I went to Johnny Ace at the time, who was talent relations, and I said, you know, I'm tired. I said, man, I, I, you know, you get, you send me to Europe, you're sending me to all the international tours. I said, you know, it's like a babysitting job half the time with these guys and girls. I said, you know, I got to do something else. And he said to me, he says, well, you always like teaching. You want to take over the developmentals. And I said, well, you got Deep South and you got OVW. What about them? And he goes, I'm going to shut them both down and I'm going to put it all in your lap in Florida if you want it. And I said, yeah, give it to me. Because I thought I was going to be home every night. <clears throat> anyway, what I did was they put it, everything was in my name. All the liability, all the responsibility, all of the debt, everything, all of the insurance, everything that had to do with that business was under Steve Kern, Inc. Nothing to do with WWE. Couldn't even use their logos. I couldn't use anything that associated with WWE because it was all supposed to be my entity. And that was just to protect their liability. And so I recre recreated the Florida territory where I grew up. I started running the towns that I ran, when, that I worked in when I was young and a kid, armories. I started the center of the state instead of the um, ocean sides, and instead of the beach towns. I was running like in the middle. I was running small towns where nobody had any entertainment. And I started compiling a good schedule to where they were working three to four nights a week in live events because that to be honest with you wrestling is an opinion everybody's got one about what it is mine is the way you learn is experience you can be in a gym all your life doing through moves but that doesn't teach you how to work in front of an audience you need to get out there and see how to how to control audiences how to take your hand and put it on the volume and turn them up Turn them down. Shut them off. I mean, you know, you need to be in control and understand that that's more important than fancy moves. Now the whole business is altered so much that everything is about movement. In my era, it was about emotion. You took them on an emotional roller coaster, and regardless if they thought wrestling was real or not, they got on board. Whereas they'd stand up, scream, yell, they'd want to riot, they'd want to fight. I mean, people would be so emotionally moved. So <clears throat> with all of that going on, I just altered it to FCW. I was in total control. The only thing they controlled is who they hired and who they fired. I refused to fire people or hire. I didn't want to have that responsibility. And I said, you know, I'll run this territory, but you got to let me run it like I know how to run Florida. I was one of the last of a dying breed that started in Florida and ran Florida with Dusty and Gordon and Mike Graham in the early 90s. And now I'm just recreating it again. But I had the backing of backing money with WWE, so I knew I could take it farther. And I expanded. I started off with flea markets, um, bars. I started any place I could gather people together to watch because it, nobody had a name. So I'm trying to draw money on no names. So what I did as a booker, I would book matches. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. I had Seamus, Drew McIntyre, Dolph Ziggler, all of them on the same card, but their names weren't even up there. I would have a uh, triple threat match, battle royal, um, mixed tag match. I would have them in names of title matches or just match gimmick gat matches so that would draw people in and then i postered towns instead of what lying on advertising in radio and tv and on newspaper i would have posters made and i would make the talent go out and put posters up all over the towns and you know gave a constant reminder for people that would see it for a week two weeks at a time to come and then by the time i got it going really good Pretty soon now, we don't have to do as much because we had a reputation and they were starting to get the fact that what I was doing was developing talent for WWE. And so 
it was a, it was a grind. And I worked probably harder than I ever worked in my whole wrestling career because I was wearing way too many hats. I was promoting. I was running the concessions. I was driving the ring truck and trailer because I didn't trust anybody to drive my truck. I mean, you know, I was I was going to make appointments with people in the buildings because I was the only name they knew in Florida from wrestling and trusted. I was opening up armories and places that had been shut down by indie groups that were paying off soldiers not to let other indie groups come in. So, you know, it took a lot of work. And then I built it up to, a, a you know, kind of like a situation where – Vince asked me to give him two guys, two guys a year, and I'll be satisfied. I gave him 18 the first year, like 38 the second year, the third and fourth year. I was in the hundreds when I was, they were mowing through the talent that I would send up there left and right, but guys were getting opportunities. So I was doing more than I needed to do, but it caught attention. It caught the attention that it was all mine. It was in my name. Everything was owned by Steve Carnage. And I think that, you know, probably just my opinion again, but I think that they saw that, hey, this is a pretty good thing. Maybe we should take this back over and only spend more money and enlarge it. And that's what they did. And they asked me if I wanted to move to Orlando and still be a part. And I said, no, I don't want to live in Orlando. There's two cities in the state of Florida that I won't live in, Miami or Orlando but I'll go back and forth. And so I worked for a year going back and forth. And then they just said, well, if you're not going to move to Orlando, we're not going to renew your contract. And I go, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm done. I'm burned out, man. I've had so much. I'm so tired of seeing poor, poor talent get to a level thinking they're going to make it and get cut for no reason. I'm so tired of listening to people cry on the phone because they don't know what they did wrong. I mean, I, I'm a compassionate guy. And anybody that does what I do, I've got respect for them. It's not, it's, you know, it's like, to me, I used to tell guys that come in there to be wrestlers, is when you step foot over that door's threshold, you've got my respect for having the guts to make that first step. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, you're going to be on the top of my list forever, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to mistreat you. I'm going to treat you like I'd want to be treated when I started. And I got, I got kind of put down a lot for being way too nice because I was compassionate with the talent. You know, so that's, you know, it might be hearsay. <laughs> the last real star, I guess, WWE has had has been Roman Reigns, who was from FCW. What are your thoughts on him? And also, why do you think NXT hasn't really produced a star that's been able to eclipse Roman Reigns yet? Well, I think there's a lot of reasons. And this is just goes back to Steve's opinion. It's not a fact. But Roman Reigns was a second-generation wrestler. I had quite a few second-generation wrestlers. I had Harry Smith, Davy Boy's son. I had Jerry Briscoe's son, Wes Briscoe. I had Charlotte Flair. I had Natty Nightheart. I had, you know, the, the Rotundo boys. I had the Bibiase boys. I had all these. Now, these are all friends of mine from my era. And so I'm kind of like watching their kids try to go through this. And I realize not all of them are cut out to be in the business because of political reasons, because of you it doesn't mean you can't be in the same business your dad was, but why not get to the level your dad was at? And I think with Roman, when I, when he first came to me, he was kind of like, I don't, I don't really, you know, care that much about this he had been a football player and then he had been diagnosed with cancer and so he was on a second choice thing with, when he came to wrestling and i kept telling him i said you know you got to be a little more aggressive you can't just get in there and lay down and let people do stuff to you, you got to kind of like you know hold your own in these things and and you know you got to kind of be a little bit of a prick sometimes just to keep yourself up and so you know they'd listen to me but you know it was it was one of those things where there's a lot of politics in this business and everybody knows it. And it's not something I'm making up. It, it's just sometimes something your dad did might've affected what you're doing right now, even though you might be as good as your dad or better. And so I saw all of that. But what I had was a success thing going on is because that I was turning talent and I was driving them by so many matches and live events. They were learning wasn't because of 
everything they learned in the gym. They had great trainers, hand-picked. I hand-picked Norman Smiley. Tom Pritchard came with me at the beginning, but I hand-picked Norman Smiley, Joey Mercury, um, Ricky Steamboat. I had Terry Taylor. I had all of these guys that were, you know, that I admired because that they were similar styles to mine. We had the same, same kind of concept of the wrestling business, same respect for it, and they had great trainers. And the thing happened was, is all of a sudden they wanted bigger and more, and sometimes. When you're trying to develop talent, it's not having a roster of 120 people in there. It's having a comfortable roster of like 50 to 60 people, and that gives them more work. A lot of times, don't guys don't get developed as quick like nowadays is because they're not getting as much experience. There's only so much time to showcase, and there's only so much time to give people matches. And if if they get on somebody and they like somebody, that means that they're there every week. And, you know, you get tired of seeing the same guy or you're, they're not having the same drive and the others are losing their interest. And you can see it in their performances when they go to the ring. They're not fired up. I tried to fire talent up. I mean, I made them pay their dues. <laughs> I was the only guy. I'm the last guy that made anybody pay their dues. Well, maybe it was just driving and putting up cards being gone all day to the town that they're going to go to in two weeks and postering it. Maybe it was setting up the ring. Maybe it was tearing down the ring. Maybe it was cleaning up the building afterwards. But I made them all work. I made them all do every job that they don't think about in wrestling, all the way down from set up, tear down, clean up, put back, whatever it is, because I wanted them to respect all the people that it takes to get that show on. And I knew I was getting to them because one of the things when they took it away, they said, well, you won't have to do no more towns and poster no more things, you know. And I'm going like, so that's your big reward to get them away from me? I said, you're making a mistake. There's no, they don't pay no dues. They're just going to come to work, collect their check. And, you know, when you pay to be in the wrestling business and you have to do something as effort for you to make it, you're going to want it more. If you come to me with a passion, I'm going to recognize passion. If you come without the passion, I'm also going to recognize that. And I might not be as hard on you as because I'm not driving you. But if I'm driving you, I'm going to be there sitting, talking to you all the time. And I'm going to give you my input. And whether you pay attention or not, you know, over the years, I knew that I didn't want to be an old wrestler. I didn't want to be able to go out and, I mean, have to be going out in front of the audience when my body was broke down, when I couldn't, you know, be comfortable about taking my clothes off and going out there in my underwear. I didn't want to let my family down, embarrass them. I didn't want to embarrass myself or kill off whatever reputation I made over the years for being the character I was. And so I said, you know, no matter what, I won't wrestle when I get older. I didn't. I, I walked away from the ring in my 40s and never went back. The only time I went back was they had a Legends Battle Royal when I was an agent up there. And Johnny Ace came to me and he said, hey, you're going to work the Legends Battle Royal. We can, you can do Skinner or Doink, whichever one. And I looked at him and said, I don't work. And he wrote down a figure on a piece of paper in front of me. And he said, how about for that? And I go, I guess I got one more match in me. I mean, you know, <laughs> might as well be a prostitute. I said, yeah, I'll do it one more time. but. I just, when I started wrestling, I was wrestling guys old enough to be my grandpa in Florida. And I said, I don't want to get to this point in my life where I have to do this because then it's not going to be fun and I'm not going to enjoy it. I'm going to be doing it because it's a battle. You mentioned Wes Briscoe and Harry Smith. Those are two of the best wrestlers today and neither are signed by a major company right now, sadly. What is your thoughts on what the issue is there? Because they're phenomenal, in my opinion. Well, I just saw Harry about three weeks ago at, at uh, Hulk Hogan's new bar in Clearwater Beach. We had gone out to dinner and we came back to his bar afterwards, our wives and us. And Harry was in there and um, a referee named Goose. And, you know, he came up to me and he asked me, he said, he's been going to Japan a lot. And he said, I said, I'd really like to get back into the WWE someday. And I said, well, you should keep trying. I said, you never know. I mean, you know, a door might just open for you. I don't know. I mean, I've seen guys 
do everything they could to never have that job again and get hired back. I mean, the ultimate warrior was one of those guys that was the worst businessman in the wrestling business there ever was. And I thought he was gone for good. Next thing I know, they're putting him in the Hall of Fame. I mean, you know, so I don't have the answers to, to what makes everything tick. But I do know that Vince has a tendency to take things, take things, you know, farther than a lot of guys. And then there must be some evil thoughts or some, you know, bad, bad reputation stuff. Bad reputation. Yeah. Uh, the bad uh, reputations with you, Hannibal, constantly taking my client's time and taking advantage of the good nature of the good captain. You've done it again. This is the last time I want a public apology. You should be apologizing because you were late, Captain. You made the fans wait for this. Late? Oh, there's no such thing as late. Could, could you demonstrate the sleeper hold on him, please? He starts earlier. We pulled up YouTube where I put, a, I put you know, an announcer. He taught me some tricks earlier today, Hannibal. I'm going to demonstrate for you when they open up those borders, okay? <laughs> so you better be careful, and that's it. <laughs>